Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Influential Nonprofit. As always, I'm your host, I'm Maria Dersh, and I work with nonprofit leaders to master the art of influence so they can build communities of support and move their missions. And I am here today with Maria Rio, and I said that right, because that rhymes, and it's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Maria Rio. And we're going to talk about community centric fundraising, which is something I know about and never really talked about um, in this format on my podcast and the YouTube channel and all that. So I am excited to unpack this. Um, and we're going to talk about the good, the bad, everything in between, and even some stats to share about what this is really like. Uh, now, Maria, is your company is uh further together right and this is like this is your expertise this is what you do you help people create community-centric fundraising and you've been doing it over a decade in the sector and you're a speaker and advocate for this so i'm just excited to have you here i am so excited to be here i have definitely heard the way that you talk about some of these things so i'm really excited to have this conversation with you around community-centric fundraising and you have a podcast too Yes, the small nonprofit. So if you if you're listening to the influential nonprofit, you got to listen to the small nonprofit. Okay. Now, before I start into the content, I like this question which is um tell me something you're really proud of that you don't get to brag about a lot. Ooh, I love it. Okay. So I am kind of a perfectionist, very type A person. I'm sure a lot of people in the sector can relate. But I've been trying to do things for just joyful reasons. So not because I can monetize it or because I'm really good at them, but just because they bring me joy. So something that I've gone and slowly better at that I'm really proud of is uh, polymer clay and drawing. So those two artistic things have been really nice, really healing, and just really different from what I do day to day that I'm really proud of taking the time to do something artistic. I love that. And also that there's no need to monetize it, right? So my my husband, his hobby, which is he's pretty intense into this. He makes like hard candy and he's a scientist, but he's a very busy mind. And that's what I call it anyway. But, it, you know, there are worse kind of midlife crises. Let's just let's just say that. But he is very busy and, you know, he makes these hard candies and he, now he even tools his own rollers and all this stuff. And he, it's really good. It's really good. And people are like, oh, can I buy this? Can I sell? And like, no, no, he doesn't like that. He doesn't like it, my, you know. But it's so interesting how we want to like think. Oh, it's not monetized, is it? And he just likes to make it and give it away, and that that makes and people are like, oh, you should sell it. Like, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to what, just produce something for the joy of producing it. Yeah, I feel like some of that for me comes from like trauma and like growing up poor that you just have to monetize everything that you're doing. So it's really hard to kind of set that boundary with myself, but I would love to try some of that candy. If you can send some over. Yeah, I would. <laughs> Sounds great. It is really good. Um, uh, yeah. And you know, it's just that, and I just love that it just brings you joy for the sake of being, you know, uh, for joy. And I understand like there, there's healing properties and also being aware of like, where is this feeling coming from where I feel like I need to like give everything a value? Oh, okay. All right. Awareness. Good. All right. So let's talk about community centric fundraising before we get into it. I just want to make sure we have a common understanding of what it is. Yeah. So community centric fundraising is a relatively new movement that was created by Boulay from uh, Nonprofit AF has a blog there, has been really radical in their approach to nonprofit and philanthropy in general. Basically, it's centering the community rather than, you know, an executive's ego or your board member or someone else, like really centering the needs and methods and values of the people that you are trying to serve in all aspects of your organization. So in fundraising, in recruitment, in your leadership, is that reflective of the people and the lived experiences that uh, your uh, program serves? And if not, why not? Sure. Okay, so how is this different than donor-centric fundraising? It's different in the application, I would say, because I don't know. There, I. There's some aspects of donor-centric fundraising that I think 
aligns really well with community-centric fundraising if it's done through a truly relational approach instead of a transactional one. So for example, a big difference would be events. Um, it wouldn't just be, hey, come to this event once a year, we'll see you next year, uh, enjoy the meal, and nothing in between, which is how we treat some of our donors right now. And we think that it's just enough to have their logo on the wall this one time a year and not talk to them or involve them in anything else. Uh, with community-centric fundraising, that's not necessarily enough. Like we really want to build true partners in the work and we want you to know about systemic issues that we're trying to solve, be a partner as an advocate or uh, in your voting or in your volunteering. So really be involved with, with the community past that transactional piece. Right. Okay. And um, all right, I'm just going to share a couple of thoughts. So I had a meeting, this was a couple years ago with somebody um, who is a fundraising expert and they said, oh, community centric fundraising, because you think you're going to raise money by telling your donors that they're racist. And I was like, that's an interesting take on this. <laughs> and I, I didn't really um, take the bait. I, I just was like, hmm, okay, <laughs> that is a way to look at things. Um, and all, and, and what I think that comes from is when you're talking about systemic issues, and I think that in, in the past or maybe in the present, there are, we, we have a hard time talking about the more complicated systemic issues that are causing the struggles that we have. So for instance, if you're working with unhoused people, um, it's, how can you not talk about, you know, racism and capitalism and the, you know, and the things that, and, and our mental health system, the things that are causing this. And we have been reluctant to have those conversation, lest that's what people think, right? Like, oh, great. Now you're making me feel bad or calling me racist. Oh, I feel like that's such a superficial understanding of how these conversations usually go. So when I start them with a donor, I will start with the community and be like, hey, like my community is experiencing X, Y, and Z. And that's tied to broader systemic issues. So like whether it's food insecurity or homelessness or like even health issues can be tied to broader systemic issues. Um, that's where I started. So on the community, and then I slowly branch out to kind of understand where their level of socioeconomic um intersectional issues actually is so if they are not even understanding pronouns and why that's important maybe you want to start with a little bit of donor education on very basic information around that right but if they're talking about anti-black racism and anti-capitalism and its relation to the nonprofit industrial complex like you can actually jump into a much deeper conversation with that person so it's not necessarily making someone feel bad because we are all on a learning journey. I remember when I used to say the most nonsensical racist jokes when I was younger and think it was funny. And it took me a long time to learn like, hey, just because you're Mexican doesn't mean that you can make jokes about Mexicans or whatever it was, right? So like slowly moving towards unlearning those bad behaviors that we have in our personal and professional lives and moving towards that education, yes, you can do it in a way that creates shame and makes people feel bad, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. We can just approach it in a way where we're learning together. Yeah. And so what I hear you is sort of just meet somebody where they're at, you know, and 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 it's a release of judgment all across the board because the moment you there's judgment, there then it stirs up feelings of guilt and shame and people are going to shut down. And that's just how our brains work. You can't fight the biology of that. But just like meeting people where they're at, okay, so okay, so we'll start here because this is where you're at instead of like, or we could start a little bit farther down the path because that's where you're at. So we'll just start here and that's okay. Um, what do you feel like is the the hesitation of sort of moving towards a more community-centric model or, or adopting it wholly? I think there's a lot of misconception around the amount of money that you can raise using a community-centric approach. 
Um, so that's one, but there's also a lot of fear. So fundraisers don't want to approach their board members and have to explain how this is different than donor centric and why it's important to take an approach that centers equity when a lot of the board members don't even reflect the lived experience or community serve. Um, so that can be quite a challenge. And also, you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you, right? You are a little bit worried about losing funds and what that could do for your organizational structure and sustainability. But I think if we give into that fear, we don't allow for the possibility for a donor to actually surprise you or a board member to surprise you. Because when I started having these conversations with donors, it was obvious that they had already been thinking about it for two to three years before I was approaching them about ethical philanthropy. So I think ever since the murder of George Floyd, a lot of people have started to really question why they have privilege and their relationship to wealth and their relationship to these various systems. So we've seen donors pledge to give their money away completely. We've seen people who are inheriting funds actually not want to do that and dispersing it before they even receive it. I've actually also seen donors close their DAFs as well. So they are really thinking about this, but because of the fear that nonprofits internally are facing, like fundraisers don't even get the opportunity to explore that radical change to philanthropy and like how people are actually envisioning themselves as change makers instead of wealth hoarders. Wow. So they're envisioning themselves as change makers instead of wealth hoarders. That's me. That's yes. Let's all do that. <laughs> right? they, they have the same goal. Like they want to make a change and maybe they just don't know some things. Like I've talked about tax avoidance with donors before and they're like, oh my God, I literally did that like two weeks ago when I did my taxes. I didn't know that that actually contributes to some societal issues. And same thing, like I'll explain like, hey, I'm a fundraiser. I also contribute to these societal issues by getting you to give me your money instead of giving it to the state. But if I don't, then people are not going to get fed or at least they'll take a long time until the state steps in and like does things properly. Yeah. So yeah. I'm also part of the system, but I don't have a better alternative. So community-centric fundraising is about trying to do things in the least harmful way possible. Like we're still working in a harmful system, but what is the least amount of harm that you can do? I think as nonprofit leaders, we want to put good in the world and it could be, I'm not saying it is, I'm saying it could be sometimes maybe hard to accept that we could also be contributing to the very issues that we are here to remedy. And that can be a very big, I want to say like pill to swallow. Um, and then once you can, but, but acceptance and awareness of that, what I'm hearing from you is that opens up then a whole nother set of possibilities and, and real true shifts. I think there's, uh, you know, you have to open up your window of tolerance to actually include that discomfort and maybe shame for not knowing. And, you know, all these like kind of negative feelings that can creep up when you're starting to realize how much you've contributed to systemic issues by just operating as, uh, as you've always have. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. those opportunities to be uncomfortable will push you to learn and will push you to be open and will push you to have kind of different conversations and seek out different voices. So there's definitely room for that. And also this model works. Okay. So, right. Uh, we kind of like slug through the difficulties, but tell me, cause this is a successful model. Tell me, and you, you, you said you have some stats to share. <clears throat> so tell me like, let's just give some people some inspiration for this. Yeah, absolutely. So I practice community-centric fundraising in my consultancy, and I've been a consultant for over a year now. Woo! Yay, and I've you! Seen, yay! And I've seen so many amazing results for my clients already. Like one organization that I worked with over the past year, we increased their revenue by 30%. Whoa! <laughs> yes. 
Um, but I like to share the examples of when I was an in-house director of development and communications as well, because we implemented four major changes. So we did um, reimagining our major donor engagement, revisiting donor-centric events like Dallas, um, defining our role in public policy, and trying to prioritize the collective mission. And my stats were great. So we grew the year over year quarter four revenue by 55%. Mm. We acquired the first million dollar gift in the organization's history. We retained 26% of 1,563 first time COVID donors in comparison to a sector average of 20%. Um, and donors returning to us to ask about CCF or to tell us that they had actually been thinking similar things all along. So when I had a foundation that we had actually not been able to retain for two years, they'd been giving $50,000 for like a decade, but they hadn't been reported to for two years. So they said, no, I'm not going to give you money, which totally fair. Um, but when I got there, I really worked really intentionally to build that relationship and to talk to them about community centric fundraising and unrestricted funds and that year to year collaboration that they came back and said, yes, I'll give you $50,000. And then they also came back to ask me questions specifically about community-centric fundraising granting models. So if you don't open up those doors, like these results might be like right underneath your fingertips. What does a community-centric fundraising granting model look like? I think it's different for each organization. Um, once you start to look at specific parts of it, sometimes things fall apart. So what, right? what you know, what what uh what I struggle with is the grants often go to people who can write the best, or like I'm part of a kind of I there's a like a women's foundation thing, and then they have oh they pick three nonprofits and they come and present, and then often people who are selected are the ones who are giving the best presentation, and the people and there's and I, I think it's can be. You no, know, oh, I know organizations run by you know people of color or things like that who they don't have the transportation, they don't have the expertise, but they have a really good cause that we're not seeing because we're valuing the you know maybe you know they're more like if we would hear um you know instead of some sort of can presentation then you know uh, just a conversation with them or something you know I I I I, I think we're sometimes we value the things that. Like the, you're going to dress a certain way or present yourself in an, oh, now, you know, professional, now, you know, reputable when and we're valuing those sort of things instead of, okay, what, how does the money best serve the community? Yeah, I think there has to be a real intentionality behind how you disperse the grants, because there's a lot of ways that bias can show up in there, right? So when you're talking about the best writer, the best speaker, then you're almost very quickly eliminating anyone who has English as a second language uh, and might not be able to perform to the level that you want them to, right? So um, I'd like to refer to these these pieces that Vu has actually put on Nonprofit AF um, because he's done a lot of extensive work when it comes to kind of identifying better granting pr uh, practices. So for example, when you're asking someone to fill out a budget on your template, that's not a great granting uh, practice because hundreds of organizations are having to do this when you're only going to accept five applications. So you have wasted people's time. You've had them come up with additional um, people that they have to involve and ideate programs that they might never come to fruition. So you ask for a lot of labor with no return. So maybe approaching nonprofits is one of them, seeking out our organizations that are currently receiving less than $1 million, $5 million, uh, intentionally deciding to give unrestricted funds versus restricted to a program or, oh, something else that's really good is funding the unsexy things. Yeah. So you go to a nonprofit, you see the tears are falling apart. You know the tears are falling apart. So why not purpose? want my donation to go towards wherever you need it uh, right. and it doesn't need to be programs so what i'm hearing is 
it's really about the trust of, you know, instead of, of a donor or a grantee or founder or anybody saying, okay, here's this money and I want you to, and I know where this money should go. And this is how you're going to solve this problem. It's, you know, tell me what's going on. Tell me how can my, how can this support you the best? Um, you know, yeah. all, right. That instead of, in, 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 instead of the donor as a hero, right. The donor is sort of a partner in, in a sense of a spirit of kind of co-creation. Like we're going to, we're going to create some, like, maybe that's not the right word, but, but definitely more of a partnership. Yeah, it's definitely a partnership. Um, and just really getting them to have the same knowledge as you do as much as possible about the issue. So instead of turning around and being like, Hey, we, you know, built 10 houses this year, like, great, amazing. We're crushing it. Uh, maybe it's good to say, Hey, we built 10 houses and our community actually needed a hundred. So is there something that we can do together to strategize around that? Whether that's a transformational gift, or maybe, you know, someone who's a politician, like what is the strategy that we can take to actually solve this problem? Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's a partnership with a different organization too. Like yeah. it's not yeah. just right. about right. your organization. Yeah. Or me, yeah. What, who, who can we collaborate with? And that's another thing about community centric fundraising. I think it's because in the, I think the traditional model, which is rooted in scarcity, all of these things are, all those fears are rooted in scarcity. There's not enough. There's not enough. If I do it differently, I won't have enough. Um, and I know community centric and all our work and what I do we're, is, is in abundance that there's enough out there for everyone. And that money is a renewable resource. Money flows, right? It's not a stagnant pond. Like you're saying, like, I'm not a what a wealth hoarder. It's like, I'm, I'm a change maker. It's like, I, when I flow money out, it flows back in and we're creating a flow. And I have to remind myself that when I'm paying a bill, like I'm, I'm creating flow, <laughs> even in your tax, you know, your tax are like, I, there's a, there's a flow to this and, and there's a trust level and there's like, and there's a breaking down of silos because I don't have to hoard my donors you know, keep my secrets close and my donors closer because lest you take them from me. Um, it's like, okay, what can we do to solve this problem? Um, and who do we, who would be best to strategize with to do this? Yeah. And I think, uh, that opens up a lot of opportunity for real partnerships. So instead of just saying like, Hey, it's transactional and we move away from, ah, Sorry, I think I got a little lost in my thoughts, but yes, I totally agree. Like with that, creating that flow and moving money uh, to mission is so important and it gives the opportunity for people to actually see themselves in the process. Yeah. And the other thing, again, I hear is trust, trust your donors, trust your supporters to be able to have the, uh, the difficult, I'm not going to call it difficult, the meaningful conversation trust them that they can handle it that that you know and a lot of like my clients that I work with that's what we're growing in our trust that we can be transparent authentic truth tellers and that will only benefit us in the long run which I feel like is really a part of this model I think something that fundraisers also forget is that our donors some of the people that I've worked with have like an insane amount of money. They have an unimaginable amount of money. So my $10 million ask, their $10 million ask, it's not going to be in competition with each other. Right. Like we, we have the opportunity to build everybody up and we have some donors who are willing to do so, but by trying to gatekeep them from your own staff, which hurts your organization and from other organizations, like who is that benefiting? And it's not usually the community members or the service users. It's usually, you know, some white executive with a big ego or, you know, a board member who's looking to rub shoulders, but that's not what the donor wants either. So it doesn't actually feel as meaningful as it could when you're sharing those relationships and talking about community care and collaboration versus just I'm the face of the organization and you're supporting because I asked you to. Yes. Okay. Really quick. I want, there's a book. I, if you haven't read it, I, it's called the soul of money and it's mm -hmm. by Lynn. Hold on. Uh, I, I want to make sure I'm not going to say it. Cause there's, um, and she is 
she, it's a, it's a book about money, but it's, but she's a fundraiser. Um, Lynn twist. That's what I thought. And she's a fundraiser. So she talked, but it's not a fundraising book. It's a book about our relationship to money and how to navigate, like, because as a, a hunger relief fundraiser, she navigated people who had nothing like nothing. And then sitting at wealthy billionaires, dinner tables and everything in between and what our relationship to money is. And that was one of the things that I learned from her is um, that, first of all, there's a flow to money. It's a renewable resource. The more we flow out, the more that flows in. And that money doesn't solve problems. People solve problems. And she told me amazing stories of how, how we can shift our relationship to money because a lot of us are afraid of it or intimidated by it. Or if you think money is the root of all evil, you're going to have a hard time raising it. <laughs> I think, yeah, we just place such a high value on money because, you know, we live in a capitalist system. I understand why, but that's what causes such a big divide between yourself and a donor. That's why you can't see them as a partner because you feel and you perceive that they have all this power over you. Yes, Yes. And over you personally too, not just over your organization, yes. but over you. Um, so I think just like when you stop thinking about money in that way and start kind of seeing yourself as like, I'm a person who cares about this. They're a person who cares about this. We're equal in that way. It just creates you, like you the have, space for and, like- And you bring your resources and your knowledge and they bring their assets and- we all have something. And that's one of the things she talks about is everybody has something to share. Everybody Absolutely. has gifts to share. And instead of like feeling like of guilt and shame and, and, and it's, uh, she talks about sufficiency and freedom and purpose. And anybody who's listening, I highly, I, I just, this one was really a huge shift for me and, and cemented a lot of the things that I was already sort of working on. No, one of the things that I train, coach and train people and influence is releasing the outcome. So this is like the biggest thing because the more you operate in fear, like if you're afraid you're not going to get something or something bad's going to happen, now you're operating in fear. And the more you operate in fear, the more you create fear because you're worried about what could happen. And 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 I feel like this is right, very much aligns with community centric, which is I release the outcome. I have, I'm sufficient. I have nothing. I. I need nothing. I have everything. You know, if this works great, if not, that's okay too. You know, my job is to create the, you know, build this community of support and, 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 and not like try to make something happen. And that, and once you like learn to release the outcome, but that's what you're talking about is like letting go of the outcome and having that conversation, letting go of the outcome and saying what's, you know, what's really important instead of like feeling like you have to Rubik's cube it to make it fit their needs. I think when you let go of the outcome too, it gives opportunity for other outcomes, unexpected outcomes. 100% the possibilities emerge. They're yes. going to add, they're, you're, you're, there's going to be stuff that you never even thought of could happen. Like all you can do is ask, right? As a fundraiser, we get told no all the time. We get told yes all the time. So all you can do is kind of explore this on your own and see how you can build those relationships with people in a really like transformational and equal footing way. I think that has been, that has really changed my relationship with fundraising and my relationship with money, like really seeing it as we all bring something to this organization, to this discussion, like program staff are the people who are delivering on this work. They're just as important as the donors. So why are we not stewarding our community in this way that actually acknowledges that yeah yeah I and and this is like I just love how the, our my philosophy and how what I coach and train and this model align because it is rooted in abundance and trust and 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 when you have those things then you can create so much but if you're rooted in scarcity and fear it's hard to grow and it's hard to enroll people in that vision that's that's rooted in scarcity and fear and, and, but, and, and Maria, like, and I know you know this, but really embody it, not just say, oh yeah, like, but feel, cause you, you had your own journey towards this. And I did too, where I can say, like, I know, I know in my, I know, I know, like, I know I'll have another breath. I know I'll have out the money will come. I know, 
you know, it's winter, but spring will come, you know, and like, and, and so we, we don't doubt that, but we doubt like, oh, what's going to happen? Where's the money? Even though it's constantly showing up. You know, another fear that I keep hearing from fundraisers who are like, I don't know about community centric fundraising is like, but we got to raise the money. We got to, you know, and it's like, well, is your, are your values, is your integrity like for sale? You know, like, do you really want to do unethical things or harmful things because, you know, you have a board member who's unsupportive because you actually don't have to stay there. And that's the other scarcity piece. Like people feel like I have to stay at this organization and like, what am I going to do otherwise? But there's so many fundraising jobs out there. So there's so many different opportunities and different cultures for you to connect with if you want to attribute your skills to an organization willing to put in ethical uh, ethical fundraising practices in place. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why I became a consultant. So I could work exclusively with organizations who are looking to do uh, community-centric fundraising. So they're out there. Yeah. And they're looking for you, you know? <laughs> so it's, you know, raise your standards, lower your expectations. Life opens up for you. Cause like you raise your standards, right? Like, like, oh, like well, we got to raise the money. And that's like, I need to, I have to, I got to, or I get to, I choose to. And that's a yes. whole different energetic because we've talked about that. Okay. So you brought up a great thing. So how do you work? How, if people are like, I would love to talk to you more about community centric fundraising. This feels really aligned with where we're going in our fundraising practices. How can, um, how do you work with clients first? Uh, so I work with clients in a few different ways. The main one is a fractional fundraising model where I support your organization for 12 months. Uh, so it gives me time to look at what you have capacity wise, whether that's people, time, um, money, events, whatever you already have going on, and then align them to your values and then move forward in a strategy that feels good for everyone. So I find that to be a really great process because I get to know everything about the organization and the team and really involve them in the decision making around what the strategy of fundraising communications looks like because I think that's another piece that we don't often talk about like the lack of trust between programs and fundraising mm -hmm. around money and the disconnect of understanding money and who the donors are so as part of community centric fundraising I love bringing as many voices as possible to the table to talk about how do we talk about ourselves <laughs> Yeah. Uh, how do we talk about our service users? Um, so yeah, just a really collaborative manner is something that I really try to bring to my client work. I love it. And I love, cause it, it takes a year. It takes a year to make true change. And you know, there's no magic wand or I've like my magic compounds, you know, like it, 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 it takes a year. It takes time. <laughs> but you're like you're laughing because I sit so close to pom poms. It's shocking, isn't it? <laughs> All right, so Maria, this has been amazing. I know we could talk more. Uh, um, and I'm gonna put um, you're on LinkedIn, um, and YouTube, and we'll put all your um, um all the ways to get in touch with you, all those links in the show notes. So if people want to come find you and I know you're on LinkedIn a lot and, and listen to the small nonprofit podcast and all of that. Uh, last question. Um, I forgot, where are you located? I'm in Toronto, Ontario. Toronto. Okay. So when I'm in Toronto, you're in St. Louis and we're at the karaoke bar. What's your go-to song and why? It's gold digger by Kanye West. And <laughs> I like right away. I know that's my go-to song. So uh, my best friend and I have been doing karaoke since we were like children and hers is American boy. Na, 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 yeah. Yes. One and mine's gold digger. And it's just always been our thing. I don't know. It's just, it's been <laughs> our thing it. for like a decade. <laughs> that's the, those are both, I, those are both really good songs. Yeah. You get, yeah. So you fun. stick with what you know then. Mm hmm. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. This was lovely. Thank you for coming in and thank you for, you know, inspiring and challenging us all to just be more intentional and, and more ethical fundraisers. And it's wonderful. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, that's it for this episode of the Influential Nonprofit. Again, if you want to get in touch with Maria, um, all the links and her email is in the show notes. Um, 
and if, or if you want to learn more about um, community centric fundraising, I'm sure your website has places to direct people to. And if you want to learn more about what it's look, uh, what it's like to work with me or what it's like to grow your influence and release the outcome and live in abundance and grace and ease and flow, uh, there's a link in the show notes to book some time with me. We can talk about what it, what your needs are, what it's like to work with me. And listen, I release the outcome. I have no ties to these conversations. So I just truly love to connect and share some wisdom. So that's it for me and this episode of the Influential Nonprofit. Thank you.